If I told you that the first song I ever made was featured in the new Spider-Man movie, you'd probably have some questions, right? Like, are you friends with the director? Did you bribe somebody? Can I have some money too? Believe it or not, this actually happened. Not with me, but with an artist named Eight, who seemingly has never released music before, but their first song was featured in the official Across the Spider-Verse soundtrack. Which is kind of a big deal, because most of the other artists on the album are pretty much household names. So how did this happen, and who is Eight? Are they an experiment by a major record label, a well-connected industry insider, or just an extremely lucky musical prodigy? Unfortunately, they haven't done any interviews or spoken on this publicly, so nobody really knows. Except me. So as you join me on this wild ride, be sure to buckle up, because this web of lies will make your head spin. Like a spider. So just to set the scene, this wasn't just your average animated sequel, okay? This wasn't Cars 2. This shit had some artistic integrity. Excuse me, ma'am. Oh, pistachio ice cream. The day it came out, Across the Spider-Verse had the biggest opening day of any movie this year so far. And with Metro Boomin producing the soundtrack, it's no wonder that it also had a top 10 debut in the Billboard 200. So to get your first song ever placed in a movie like this wouldn't just be a huge W, it'd be a career-defining moment. A quadruple U. Even. But believe it or not, the movie itself wasn't actually this song's first big placement. Less than two weeks before the movie came out, this song was actually featured in Fortnite as part of a limited time event. Yeah, you couldn't even listen to it on streaming services yet, but you could sure as hell jam out to it with a bunch of nine-year-olds in a Fortnite lobby. So that meant by the time Metro officially announced Eight's involvement in the soundtrack, some people already recognized her from the Fortnite event. But most people definitely didn't. The comments section was filled with hundreds of people that were essentially saying the same thing. Who? Because most of them hadn't heard of her before, a bunch of commenters started accusing Eight of being an industry plant, which, if you're not aware, is essentially just a new artist who's being secretly propped up by a record label. And honestly, I can definitely see where they're coming from. Eight's Instagram account had just been created earlier that month, and at that point, she didn't even have a Spotify profile, let alone other music. The Genius page for the song says that this was Eight's musical debut, and considering the fact that it helped her rack up over 2 million monthly listeners in just 7 days, that would make this one of the most successful music musical debuts since goddamn Billie Eilish. And she basically is an industry plant. So yeah, when people started suggesting that there might be a label pulling strings for this new artist on the Spider-Verse soundtrack, I didn't think it was the craziest thing in the world. But I had this sneaking suspicion that there might be more to the story. So, how do you prove that someone's an industry plant? Well, in order to become an industry plant, you probably have to know somebody in the industry first. Someone with connections, someone with influence. Someone like Metro Boomin. And if we're going off random Instagram comments, Eight is actually related to Metro Boomin. How, you might ask? Not sure, but probably family. So I started coming through Metro Boomin interviews to see if he mentioned Eight anywhere, but there was nothing. Hell, Eight herself hadn't even done any interviews, so honestly, there wasn't really anything for me to go off of. Unless I, say, interviewed her myself. Which I didn't, because she didn't get back to me, but I wasn't totally out of ideas just yet. You see, I noticed a few comments on her Instagram post from a verified user named Olivia Geller, who appears to be her manager. Was this the industry insider who helped Eight get on the Spider-Verse soundtrack? There was no way to know for sure. Unless I, say, interviewed her instead. Which I also didn't because she also didn't get back to me. Why was this so easy last time? But I think she definitely saw the message because the very next day she posted an Instagram story celebrating the song hitting 7 million streams despite Eight still being a quote unquote mystery. Well, you know what, Olivia? Consider that challenge accepted. Since nobody wanted to talk, it was going to be pretty tough figuring out how Eight got connected with Metro Boomin in the first place. And since she's a new artist with no interviews and minimal press coverage, finding background information on her was going to be nearly impossible. Nearly. Impossible. Thanks to a super useful but very underappreciated Spotify feature, I was actually able to figure out Eight's name pretty easily. You see, if you go to the credits section on a Spotify track, the written by section lists out all the songwriters who worked on the song. And since this name belongs to Offset, and these names belong to the producers, that means that Eight's name is probably Olivia Waith. And let me tell you folks, after doing some research, I can now say with 100% confidence that Eight isn't exactly new to music. So how exactly did she pull this off? Well, in order to answer that question, we actually have to go all the way back to 2007.
Olivia Waithe got her start in music as Livy Frank. While growing up in Barbados, she started writing songs at 14, and eventually she caught the attention of some local producers who helped her record her first demo. Now, it was 2007, she was 18, and she was on her way to pitch the demo to a bunch of record labels in New York. She'd end up meeting with about five or six different labels. Some of them just straight up rejected her. Some of them weren't really sure, it was kind of a thanks, we'll let you know kind of situation. But one of them really liked what they heard. After meeting with the label three or four times and performing for the CEO himself, Livy would end up signing a deal with Jive Records. And for an unknown artist in 2007, this was a huge deal. At this point, Jive was home to Justin Timberlake, Pink, Usher, Sierra, Chris Brown before all of that stuff. So for an aspiring artist, Jive Records was the record label to be signed to. And from there, she hit the ground running. She started working on her debut album, and for the next year or so, she was in recording session after recording session, sometimes writing over 10 songs a week. She was working with some of the most prominent producers in the industry at this point, so for an 18, 19 year old girl who had never gotten a behind the scenes look at any of this stuff before, it was a lot to take in. With each new session, she was experimenting with different styles and eventually she felt like she had finally discovered her sound, to which her record label basically said, nah, I don't think so. You see, Livy had gravitated towards a more retro indie style and I guess Jive Records just didn't think that would be very popular in the US. Which is kind of hilarious in retrospect because just a few years later, Lana Del Rey's second album debuted at number two on the US charts. So Livy was basically just ahead of her time, but Jive Records did not see it. Livy was obviously disappointed by this, but she didn't let it stop her. She kept grinding out tracks and eventually she recorded the track that would end up being her debut single. To Livy, it wasn't really anything special. I mean, at this point she had written and recorded over a hundred songs, but this one was a little bit different from the others. It had a club dance beat and some pretty risque lyrics for the 2000s and the label thought it was perfect. So while she wasn't exactly in love with this song, Livy decided to just roll with it. After all, this was the moment she had been waiting for. And the first single is uh, Now I'm That Bitch. Now I'm That Bitch. Now I'm That Bitch. I'm That Bitch. Where are those bitch? bitches? Almost two years after signing to Jive Records, Livy released her debut single Now I'm That Bitch in summer of 2009. She even got a feature from none other than Mr. 305 himself. Just a few weeks after the song was released, it hit number one on the US dance charts. And just a couple weeks after that, the music video premiered on MTV. Yeah, a music video on MTV. That's, that's how long ago this was. To keep the hype train chugging along, Jive Records sent Livy on a full-scale promo tour, and for weeks, she basically did nothing but back-to-back -back interviews and club performances. And this is where things kind of started to fall apart. I mean, she wasn't even thrilled about this song in the first place, so while I'm sure it was super exciting to finally see all of this hard work finally come to fruition, I can't imagine how exhausting it must have been to do nothing but talk about and perform this one song for weeks on end. And don't forget, this song was everyone's first impression of her too, so the world basically saw Livy Frank as nothing more than a dance R&B singer from Barbados. So, as you can imagine, the comparisons to Rihanna were never ending. A lot of people are drawing parallels to Rihanna. You're from Barbados. Yes, I am. Are you friends with Rihanna? Do you get compared to Rihanna? Despite how annoying this must have been for her, she handled it pretty well and basically just said, look, I, I get it, I'm flattered, but when my album comes out, you'll get to hear all my other music and realize that I have my own sound but the pressure of everyone else's expectations also extended to her live performances. Her team insisted that she sing over the original track with the vocals included, not just the instrumental, which if you're a trained singer is kind of insulting, maybe? She said, sometimes I was completely lip syncing. I would come off stage so annoyed with myself. In the back of my head, a voice was saying, you're a vocalist, not Britney Spears but I ignored that little voice to appease my team's suggestions of what would be the best thing to give an exciting performance. So unsurprisingly, by the time she came home from the promo tour, Livy was completely drained. By trying to please everyone around her, she not only lost the connection with her audience, but with herself. Her album never saw the light of day, and the world never got to hear Livy Frank as she wanted to be heard. But that's not where Olivia's story ends. Since then, she's actually cultivated an extremely successful songwriting career where she's had the opportunity to actually experiment with different styles without being held back by her label. She's written songs for Coldplay, Jason Derulo, Britney Spears, and funny enough, Rihanna. Full circle. It would take me way too long to list out all the other notable artists she's worked with, but you get the idea. She is super well-connected in the music industry, and considering the fact that she's been working with some of the most popular producers since she was 18, it's really no wonder that she eventually got connected with Metro Boomin. So we've conclusively established that no, eight is not an industry plan. 
But why did she start this new artist project? Why did she go out of her way to hide her past and present herself as a mystery? After all, it's not like her career as Livy Frank was a failure. I mean, her debut single was a literal chart topper, and might I remind you who else was on the track? Mr. Worldwide! But if there's anything we've learned from her past life, it's that the Livy Frank that we saw was not who she wanted to be seen as. By starting over with a completely clean slate, Olivia has the chance to step back into the spotlight and show off her vocal skills without being changed to the expectations that come with the name Livy Frank. I mean, think about it. Would you rather people accuse you of being an industry plant or a so-called Rihanna clone who had a hit song 15 years ago? All things considered, I think she made the right choice. So best of luck to eight and rest in piss, Jive Records. I love going down rabbit holes like this. Let me know in the comments if there are any other mystery artists you want me to look into. And hey, just out of curiosity, do you live near any of these cities? No? Well, then you better start looking for plane tickets because I'm going on tour with Ryan Celsius this summer. And if you like the music you're listening to right now, you'll like it even more when I play it live. So tickets are on sale at endofunderground.com. I'll see you there. I definitely won't be playing the first song I ever released because it was absolute hot doo-doo garbage, but if you want to see me react to it, you can go see that on the Patreon. Anyways, if you want to stay in touch, subscribe to the channel and join the Discord. Other than that, that's about it for me. I'll see you guys in the next one.